Australia marches with Britain. From her fighting men to her army and overalls. Land of plenty. Land of untold resources. All placed gladly, willingly, at the feet of Mother England. Wool blankets the world, helps to win wars. And the greatest wool producing nation in the world backs Britain to the last man, the last shilling, the last sheep. They won't reach England. We Australians have a special relationship with war. We fight mostly against people with whom we have no quarrel and who offer no threat of invasion. Australians fought in China during the Boxer Rebellion, in New Zealand against the Maoris, in South Africa against the Boers, in Europe against Germans, in Korea against Koreans, in Vietnam against Vietnamese. And here are all the names of those who went to all those wars and never came back. This is the National War Memorial in Canberra, a shrine built on a forbidding scale. It's always appeared to me to be a celebration of Australia's extraordinary blood sacrifice and of the readiness of our colonial politicians to send willing young men to be martyred for some imperial cause that didn't concern them. These 50 years have been the most eventful in all human history. Bring One of Australia's most famous warlords was Billy Hughes, who was Prime Minister during the First World War. The Hughes was known as the Little Digger, Digger being the Australian word for soldier, although he himself never fought in any war. But he loved the British Empire with a passion and made a reputation by calling it to arms. We must guard up our loins, we must have abiding courage and faith, and our faith must be fortified by deeds. War, said Hughes after the bloodletting at Gallipoli in 1915, war prevents Australians from becoming flabby. War has purged us from physical and moral decay. In that particular war, Australia, with fewer than five million people, lost more men than the United States lost in World War I and indeed in all the years of the Vietnam War. Since then, we've remembered the undisputed bravery of our soldiers in a way that has made bearable our part in other people's wars. This is Anzac Day being celebrated in the town of Villers Bretonneau in northern France, where Australian diggers turned back the Germans in 1918. As at Gallipoli, Australian and other colonial troops were often the most expendable. Their bones are still visible in the fields here. On the walls of the local school are the words, N'oublions jamais l'Australie, never forget Australia. But why did they go? According to Billy Hughes, it was to maintain the ideals of white Australia. But no one said what those ideals were. In the end, most Australians realized the terrible confidence trick of it all and voted no to conscription. But by then it was too late. 200,000 Australians were dead and wounded. France and Australia, says a plaque here, 
are forever in bonds of friendship. These bonds have not prevented French governments from exploding nuclear weapons near Australia and poisoning the grandchildren of those who died here. World War I was something of a family squabble between German and British royalty, between Kaiser Bill II and his cousin George Saxe Coburg, otherwise known as George V, who wisely changed his name to Windsor. My grandfather, Richard Pilger, was one of the war's other victims. He was a German sailor, writer and musician who once took a Spanish name when he jumped ship and lived as a fugitive in Costa Rica. He sailed often to Australia, where he became one of Australia's first naturalised citizens and where he met Alice, my grandmother. Well, the fugitive finally came ashore here among the vineyards and coal mines of the Hunter Valley of New South Wales. And when the First World War broke out, he offered himself to the Australian Army. He was very proud of his new Australian nationality, but he was too old to fight. Then a nightmare began. He was driven out of every job he got when they found out. German. Desperate to feed his family, he went on the road, picking up what work he could find, until the inevitable accusation, German, out. Also, as the son of a German, my father was treated badly at school. And a generation later, during another war, his eldest son, my brother, was stoned at school for his German name. Now these things tend to happen in a land of immigrants, especially one that fights other people's wars. For Australians, World War II arrived with the bombing of Darwin in 1942. It was Japan's mightiest blitz after Pearl Harbor. 59 times bombers struck at Darwin until it was destroyed. In all, five Australian towns were bombed. A Labour government was elected led by John Curtin, an ailing and brave man who enraged Churchill by countermanding his order and bringing home Australian troops from the Middle East. The full cabinet today directed the war cabinet to gazette the necessary regulations for the complete mobilisation and the complete ordering of all the resources human and material in this Commonwealth for the defence of this Commonwealth. The nation looked for a beam of hope. General MacArthur's arrival in Australia after a dramatic escape from the Philippines by motorboat and plane fulfilled that hope. Australia's confidence rallied round a great leader. The Australian Prime Minister of the day, John Curtin, wasn't told when MacArthur was arriving in Australia. He asked and, and he was told, I'm sorry, we can't tell you. Now, from that point on, 1942, the Americans treated Australia in that way. General MacArthur, again, was urged by General George Marshall, his superior, to have uh, Australian field officers in his intelligence uh, section when he was in Australia. And he replied, no, no, they're too busy. They don't have any senior people. Now, the records show that he'd never asked the Australians, never asked Blamey, or other senior Australian officers whether they, they could supply somebody. So the whole attitude was uh, more or less like we were white Filipinos. Uh, we would do their bidding and we wouldn't complain. On a moonlit night in March 1942, three Japanese submarines entered Sydney Harbour, causing death and panic. All our fears of Asia were now coming home. This, at last, was our war. A week later, the largest submarine surfaced off Bondi Beach and fired three shells at my mother's washing. It's all right, Elsie, said a friend as the shells screamed overhead. Your name's not on them. One shell landed across the street and didn't explode, and one of our neighbours broke his ankle leaping out of bed. But that was quite enough for Elsie and many mothers like her, who bundled up us kids and headed west into the bush. Evacuated to the outback, we thought we'd be safe. But there were no real defences anywhere and few people to build them. It was decided, though never spelt out, that an imaginary line would be drawn west from Brisbane and there we'd stand and fight. At least the Roos and Dingoes would. <laughs> 
food was rationed and the great unthinkable became law. The brewing of beer was restricted. And yet there was something unreal about it all. The dad's armies with their ancient rifles didn't have a clue. And our newsreel still reported Europe as the real war. It was almost as if our compass was spinning and we were finding out for the first time where in the world we lived and might die. All help to God. Most unusual guard this in all the Empire's army. At Wongaretta Camp, Victoria, we meet the only all Aboriginal squad in the AIF. Original Aboriginal Anzacs. They're not in the army as a curiosity. They are volunteers in the service of the country they love. They come from Australia's oldest family. They've got a fighting tradition thousands of years old. In the battle dress of the soldier of 1941, hunting through the Australian bush, where once, like black shadows, their ancestors stalked the foe. Here, surely, is one of the strangest sidelights of the greatest war the world has known. With fixed bayonets instead of the spears their forefathers carried, with bullets instead of boomerangs, the dark-hued diggers go into action. Now out of uniform into civvies for a change. Six little digger boys out on the street. Half were torpedoed and then there were three. Boots, mere ornaments to a race that's gone barefooted for a million years. So much for the propaganda. Up to 1951, Australian army rules stated that only persons who are substantially white are to be enlisted. But in spite of every obstacle, Aborigines fought in both world wars. They received less than half the pay of white troops and few of the benefits. Several were decorated for bravery. The end of World War II raised the highest hopes for an independent Australia at last. The Labour government described its vision as the new world. Australia was to be in the southern hemisphere as Sweden was in the north. Libertarian, non-aligned, prosperous, envied and above all, at peace. The new world was the dream of this man, Dr. Herbert Veer Evert, a dominating figure in the framing of the United Nations Charter. As first president of the United Nations, it was Evert who announced the Declaration of Human Rights. This was perhaps the highest point in white Australia's history. It was also one of the briefest, for Evert was to pay dearly for his modest dream. Documents now reveal that the post-war Labour government was declared a security risk by the United States, which, through its embassy in Canberra, embarked on a campaign of smear and destabilisation of an ally. In 1949, Labour was defeated by the Conservative Robert Gordon Menzies, who rushed to reassure the great protector. The world needs the United States of America. The world needs the British peoples of the world. The world needs every scrap of democratic strength. May all that you stand for, and that we stand for, be preserved under the providence of God for the happiness of... McCarthyism was imported into Australia. People were harassed for their political views. Evert's political career was ruined over a bogus spy case known as the Petrov Affair and many of a generation were traumatised into silence. A sick feeling of repugnance and apprehension grows in me as I near Australia. Those words were written not by a visiting English cricket captain, but by Robert Gordon Menzies, the longest serving Prime Minister of Australia, until he was finally promoted to Lord Warden of the Sink Ports in his beloved England. Menzies didn't really like Australia and us, and perhaps that helps to explain why a good Australian statesman is still too often one who serves foreign interests. I grew up in the Menzies years, the 1950s. Oddly enough, for a society proud of its disdain for politicians and its irreverent wit, neither was ever really applied to Menzies. For he was our better, the kind of puffed up figure many Australians admired, regardless of his indiscretions,
his admiration for Hitler in the 1930s, for example. You see, he was our statesman, the Queen's man, who could be trusted not to adjust his groin in the company of Her Majesty and at those councils of the world that demanded his presence, which were few. Mr. Menzies, he's such a good-looking man, and he speaks so nicely. Anyway, you get fined two pounds if you don't vote. Menzies loved the Queen so much. Keep an eye on her face when she's heard this. Every man, woman and child who even sees you with a passing glimpse will remember it with joy. Remember it in the words of the old 17th century poet. I did but see her passing by, and yet I love her till I die. During the 1950s, Menzies allowed the British to explode a dozen nuclear bombs in Australia. The result is this atomic desert, where very little grows. Poison, perhaps forever. The equivalent of a nuclear battlefield, greater in area than Wales and Ireland combined. Almost everything went wrong. The wind changed and radioactive dust drifted over our cities and gave cancers to God knows how many. This warning sign is in several languages, except Aboriginal. Many Aborigines who lived here were simply not told. This is ground zero at one of the British test sites. All this land, for as far as you can see, is highly contaminated, a nuclear rubbish tip. Indeed, Australia has the distinction of being the only country in the world to have supplied uranium for nuclear bombs, which its prime minister, that's Menzies, allowed to be dropped by a foreign power on his own people and without warning. The British government's attitude then was similar to that of the first British colonizers of Australia 200 years ago, that this was an empty land and therefore expendable, that the Aboriginal people who lived around here didn't really count as people, and indeed they were not counted unlike the cattle and sheep. A Royal Air Force sergeant who served here was threatened with prosecution by the special branch in Britain after he disclosed that he'd seen between four and five hundred Aborigines in the contaminated areas. Occasionally, he said, we'd bring them in for decontamination. Other times, we just shooed them off like rabbits. Uh, the members of the family had to be decontaminated. They had a dingo dog, which was customary, which had to be destroyed. And instructions were given to the next station to undertake uh, further decontamination and to give the family uh, a new uh, dingo dog. What I found out for the first time a couple of years ago when I was on the commission into the nuclear tests was that when Attlee asked, Attlee was in for a few months before Churchill took it, when Attlee asked Menzies if Menzies would lend him his country for the atomic tests, Menzies didn't even consult anybody in his cabinet. He just said yes. With anything that came from the British, it was asking you shall receive. It was just a, a manifestation of his almost puerile anglophobia. He saw the British as I think the British have never seen themselves. Mm. As God's anointed, although there are a few of those too, aren't there? Mm. <laughs> although the McClellan Royal Commission condemned both politicians and scientists, the British government still has not agreed to clean up this vandalism in the heart of Australia. Yami Lester, an Aborigine, is one of its victims. I don't know how many days after, but most of the people were sick. And uh, we all got um, um, skin rash and diarrhoea and sore eyes and uh, red, red eyes and you couldn't open it and or you open it and it was hurting and you know tears and that all that. I believe that some people died because of um, we didn't have any 
proper treatment, you know, there's no white doctors or white nurses there. That's happened, I think, 1953. Then, uh, 57, I went blind then. These are the people of Maralinga who have come back to reclaim their lands. There are now monitors to measure the radioactivity in their lives. In 1987, traces of deadly plutonium were discovered near their camp, but the scientists say it's an acceptable level. They said that before. This is the world Australia lives in, 13,000 miles from Europe at the southern tip of Asia. Australia's closest neighbours represent most of humanity, from China to Indonesia. And this is tiny Possession Island, just across Torres Straits from Papua New Guinea. It was here in 1770 that Captain James Cook came ashore to announce to the seagulls that Australia now belonged to King George III, and to make it all sound legal, he ordered muskets to be fired, and he gave it the strange name of New South Wales. No one lives on this island these days, although someone has stayed long enough to make off with a plaque on Cook's monument, no doubt acting in the best traditions of our colonial history. It's this closeness to Asia that has dominated Australia's thinking since Cook's day, usually for the wrong reasons. Even Australia's National Day, when the states federated in 1901, was not so much a bold declaration of independence as a rather humbling expression of fidelity to a great protector. By uniting, the Antipodean colonies were simply making it easier for the Royal Navy to defend them. Since then, we Australians have paid for our suburban bliss with rape fantasies about the Yellow Peril, as if our neighbours are about to fall down on us under the force of gravity. This, of course, has never happened even during World War II, when Churchill lowered the Union flag on Australia's defences, the Japanese failed to invade, wisely returning as conquering Toyota salesmen and property developers. And here on nearby Thursday Island, Australia's foreign policy over 200 years is eloquently expressed in these mighty cannon installed to frighten away the Imperial Russian fleet, which never showed the slightest intention of ever invading. You see, what happens is that, um, uh, that there's no sense of region. There's no awareness of where Australia is. And what happens is that we constantly fight other people's wars, if you like, or we take on board other people's problems. By other people, I mean Britain and America, America in particular. Vietnam is one of Australia's neighbours, Though when these pictures were taken during the 1960s, few Australians knew where Vietnam was. It was somewhere in the Far East, or was it the near north? For more than a decade, Vietnam ceased to be a country and became a war. I was there as a correspondent during much of that time. Vietnam was Australia's secret war. Secret because many Australians still believe we were the innocents of that war, dragged in by the United States. The opposite is true. Documents now reveal that from 1962, Australian governments were prime movers in starting the war in Vietnam. The aim was to draw the full power of America into the region and to maintain a Western colonial order in Asia. This purpose was concealed from the Australian public and parliament and throughout the war, those Australian diplomats, scholars and journalists who dared to question the real aims of the war were punished, intimidated or smeared. The result was carnage in a small country, the true scale of which may never be understood. More than two million people were killed in Vietnam and at least as many maimed and otherwise ruined. The overwhelming majority of the victims were Vietnamese, 
This was a war of rampant technology against a peasant people. It was not a mistake, as many still believe. It was the planned destruction of a country in order to crush its independence movements. During the years I reported the war, the United States dropped on Vietnam the greatest tonnage of bombs in the history of warfare and pursued strategies deliberately designed to force millions of people from their homes. In all of this, Australia was America's principal ally. I'm heartily in favour of the American involvement in Vietnam. Are you prepared? To I've said so time after time. Are you prepared to back this up with, say, a deeper involvement as far as Australia is concerned? Oh, well, look, look, don't ask me what we're going to do in the future, but as you know, we have, in fact, not only supported them, first of all, with some Air Force items and then with some technical advisors and so on, but now with a, with a battalion of the regular army. So our attitude is quite clear. But his attitude was anything but clear. In 1964, unknown to the Australian people and parliament, the Menzies government launched an extraordinary campaign to push America deeper into the war at a time when Vietnamese on both sides were meeting in secret and talking peace. On April the 29th, 1965, Menzies announced in federal parliament that Australian combat troops were going to Vietnam. We are in receipt, he said, of a request by the government of South Vietnam for military assistance. But this was a lie. Menzies received no such request. All there was was this letter, in which the South Vietnamese government merely confirmed Australia's offer of troops. Menzies introduced conscription, but the evidence of his duplicity was not tabled in Parliament for six years until just before the last Australian soldier was withdrawn from Vietnam and almost 500 were dead and thousands maimed. We invaded Vietnam the same way as the Japanese invaded Asia and the Germans invaded Europe in World War II. We simply went there for political and military gain. When you think of the 496 Australians who died in Vietnam, not to mention the two million people that died throughout that war, what are your feelings? Well, I think it was a criminal act by our government to involve us. I think it was a criminal act by the Americans to, to have such a, a shallow perception of Asia to go into there in the first place. During the war, the Australian government once complained, politely, that it was not well informed about what exactly the United States was doing in Vietnam. William Bundy, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, replied with these words. You are with us come what may. Australia, by its subservience, has sacrificed the right to be informed. I remember one night with a very senior American officer who was a, a close friend of mine, and he had nothing but praise for the expertise and the discipline of the Australian soldier. And he told me, we really like having you guys here. And I said, why is that? He said, well, he said, you know, he's a very good. He said, just help us a lot. He said, it's, it's like the British having the Gurkhas. We have the, the British have the Gurkhas and we have the Australians. I found that hard to understand. And it made me think that maybe we've simply changed one political master for another. In 1967, I flew in a helicopter over Ku Chi in South Vietnam, and it was thick with forest. This is what it looks like today. The land is dead, perhaps for a generation, the result of chemicals which profoundly change the genetic order. Six pounds of a deadly poison called Agent Orange were dropped for every man, woman and child in Vietnam. And these are its victims, 
The Australian government at first denied taking part in chemical warfare, but this was proven to be false. Where you lived, whether it was with the Americans or with the Australians, mm -hmm. the area was constantly sprayed with insecticides, uh, which had in them uh, uh, a white powder. It was dildren, wasn't it, Brian? Dildren, dildren which mm -hmm. is now banned. Mm -hmm. And you would go in to eat in the mess halls and, uh, uh, or in the tent or, or wherever and brush the white powder literally off where you slept, shake your cup and, and, and uh, your knife and fork and eat. The Perimeters were continuously sprayed either from the air or by young soldiers carrying backpacks with uh, herbicides. We didn't know what they were. I suppose nobody knew what they were. Uh, and what was in the herbicide? What ingredient was that? Do you well, that, they were the 2442T, right. uh, as I understand. I didn't know at the stage, and uh, uh, I'd never even heard of chemical herbicides before I went to Vietnam. And uh, you'd fly over the country and see large tracks of the, of the place like a desert, you know, with the, the trees mm. sticking up like dead snow gums mm. through rocks where they'd been sprayed and sprayed and sprayed again. When I came home from Vietnam in 1972, I weighed nine stone four, which is mm. terribly light for me. And uh, I was covered in rashes, unbelievable rashes. Mine were like gigantic ringworms from the, from the tip of the toes through to around the stomach and under the arms. I still have those rashes. I still bathe twice a day in vitamin E oil. And I still use various stronger ointments when they uh, break out to the point where they bleed. Now I've had those rashes since 1972. I remember a sergeant's mess function in 1978, which was a Christmas function, where the uh, members brought their wives and children. And I just sat there looking around, counting the sick physically sick, disabled children. And in the sergeant's mess, which is not very large in a unit, it was enormous. There was 30% of those children, there was something wrong with them in a very small group such as that. American veterans of Vietnam have been compensated for what Agent Orange did to them. Australian veterans, like the Vietnamese people, have received nothing. A Royal Commission in Australia concluded that Agent Orange was, to use the Commissioner's word, innocent. But this became a national scandal when it was found that half the Commission's summing up had been lifted directly from the evidence of the chemical company. It's estimated that as many Australian veterans have committed suicide as died in the entire war. In 1987, they were given a parade through the streets of Sydney. It was a parade of victims. They got cheers and tears, but no public apology. Today, Australian schoolchildren are taught little about why their fathers were sent on false pretenses to help destroy a small, impoverished country. The Hollywood version of movies that pity the invader has become the popular history. In 1972, the Labour Party won power under Gough Whitlam, and for the first time since 1788, Australia had a truly independent government. No country, wrote an American observer, has reversed its posture in international affairs so totally without first having passed through a domestic revolution. Gough Whitlam's first hundred days have no parallel in any modern democracy. Australians were ordered to stop fighting in Vietnam. Conscription was ended. Those jailed for opposing the war were freed unconditionally. Royal patronage was scrapped. Abroad, Australia recognised China long before Washington and once again spoke up for the rights of small nations and the Palestinians. This was unheard of. Equal rights were legislated for women, spending on education was doubled, and the film industry was reborn, and so was the nation. But none of these changes equaled the threat to America's secret bases in Australia. <laughs> 
There are 12 principal American facilities in Australia, of which these three at Narunga, Pine Gap and Northwest Cape are among the most secret and important strategic bases in the world. Uh, Australia is the big, uh, is the jewel of, of, of Southeast Asia. I mean, and what with the way things are going in uh, the Philippines, uh, what may happen in Formosa and other things. Um, I mean, looking down the road, Australia is going to become increasingly more important to the United States. No American base is more isolated than Pine Gap near Alice Springs. It is supplied by so-called black flights, direct from Guam in the Pacific, about which local Australian services are told nothing. Officially, it is a joint facility with Australia, but this is a cover. It was planned, set up and run by the CIA as the eavesdropping capital of the world. Here at nearby Narunga, information is gathered from satellites spying on Russia that is vital to President Reagan's Star Wars program. Narunga is so secret that this is the only known photograph of it. Now, our friendly Australian landlords haven't yet demanded their rent. But we Americans want to always be good tenants. We want you to know that we pay our bills promptly. Here then, Mr. Prime Minister, I want to present you with one peppercorn payment in full for the first year's rent. I thank you very much. At Northwest Cape, the order to fire is transmitted to American nuclear submarines. In 1973, during the Middle East War, President Nixon put US forces on nuclear alert through this base in Australia. When Gough Whitlam found out and said that World War III could begin in Australia without the government knowing, he was right. Australians had been made prime Soviet targets and they didn't know it. There was no early warning, no protection. Whitlam made it clear to Washington that their bases were no longer sacrosanct and the treaty governing Pine Gap, due to expire in December 1975, might not be extended. I think if the Australians really understood how little intelligence Australia gets out of the bases, that they'd be so happy to have them on the property. If there were a true sharing arrangement, if Australia got the intelligence take, what we collect off these marvelous technological satellites, and got to use it for its own defense, I think Australia then would say, okay, we've made a fair deal. But when the bases are being used to send messages back and forth by the CIA on how to better subvert the Australian government by influencing labor unions, when the bases are used to domestically interfere with the Australian regime, then I don't think the Australians are getting a fair deal. On November the 2nd, 1975, Whitlam demanded to know the names of CIA agents working undercover in Australia. In Washington, this was seen as a direct threat to American global power, and the CIA took action. On November the 8th, 1975, the CIA's Chief of East Asia, Theodore Shackley, summoned the Australian intelligence representative to his office here at the CIA. Shackley spelt out the message that the United States now considered Australian Prime Minister Gough Whitlam a security risk in his own country and threatened to cut off all American intelligence links with Australia. Shackley was the CIA's covert action expert. His record of intervention in other countries stretch from Cuba to Vietnam to Chile. Events now led inexorably to this man in a black top hat, Sir John Kerr, Governor General of Australia, lover of imperial pomp and a staunch monarchist. Since World War II, Kerr maintained a strong interest in intelligence matters. During the 1950s and 60s, he was closely associated with two right-wing organizations both of which were exposed in Congress in February 1967, one as CIA funded, the other as a CIA front. A top CIA source in Washington 
has named a former senior Australian civil servant as the CIA's principal contact, who had direct links with Kerr. They threatened to cut off intelligence relations because Whitlam was a security threat. Mind you, they had previously in Vietnam done just that. Frank Snip recalls that <clears throat> when he was serving in Saigon for the CIA and Whitlam came to power, they were told to have nothing to do with the Australians in Saigon but to treat them as North Vietnamese collaborators. The CIA chief at TRW, a man named Mr Joe Harrison, referred to the Australian Governor-General as our man Kerr. Now, I don't think this indicated by any means that, that Sir John Kerr was on the payroll of the CIA, but it does seem to suggest that the CIA believed they could trust him to act in the interests of the Western Alliance, and not necessarily in the interests of Australia. On November the 11th, 1975, Kerr, acting in the Queen's name, sacked the elected government of Australia. The reason given was the denial of budget resources to the Whitlam government by the Senate. Kerr has maintained that he acted in Australia's best interests, but many Australians see it as a constitutional coup d'etat. For the CIA, it was a repeat of their successful overthrow of the Chile government just two years earlier. What are some of the specific examples you would give to substantiate that? Well, how about a call from the CIA to MI5, MI6, saying we have a security problem in Australia. We have a security problem with the Prime Minister. He is endangering national security for the United States and the Alliance. What's the evidence? The evidence is that he's making noises about our bases, He's making threats. Those bases are absolutely essential to the survival of the Alliance. That plants a seed in the British intelligence community. Are you saying that such a call took place? Absolutely. More than one call. Dozens of calls. It became a, a part of the policy. Now, what caused the Brits to act? What caused the English to act? What caused Kurt act? I don't think you could say the CIA forced Kerr to sack Whitlam. But I think that decisions were made that led to his sacking based on what the CIA was telling the English. You have it on good authority that those calls I have it on place. authority at the highest levels of the U.S. intelligence community. And that there was genuine concern over the loss of those bases. So this is a direct implication of MI5 and MI6 with the overthrow of the no, Whitlam government. No, I, I wouldn't call it an overthrow. They made a recommendation. All right, well, with the they demise. They made a recommendation. The, yeah. With the demise, yeah. They made a recommendation. I think Whitlam was perceived as a danger. And in a way, it allowed a duly elected prime minister to be tossed out of office. It's a little scary, really, when you think about it. You're saying he was set up. Oh, I don't think there's any question that he was set up, and I think he stupidly did everything he could to uh, cooperate in the setup. I think the British were probably uh, instrumental in, uh, in getting rid of Whitlam, mm. perhaps more so than the United States. Mm. And we would be very likely to turn to the British in a case like this. We could, we could say to them, with, with all your connections and influence, uh, you can do this much better than we can. Whitlam called on Australians to maintain your rage, but it was too late. On March the 10th, 1976, a CIA briefing document for the President described the right-wing trade union leader, Bob Hawke, as the best qualified to replace Whitlam as Labour leader. The CIA judgment on what was best for Australia came true. How, how would that, uh, that aberration of Whitlam compare with the present government of Bob Hawke? Well, I think they learned a lot from Whitlam. See, and then when Hawke came along, uh, they, they didn't panic uh, to begin with. And then Hawke immediately uh, sent signals to indicate that uh, he knew how the game was played and uh, who was buttering his bread and so on and so forth and became very cooperative and even obsequious in some fashions, you know. Uh, 
He'll make speeches that sound real big and tough about the United States selling wheat to the Soviets and this is terrible and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't do anything about it. I mean, Bob Hopkins is your consummate uh, politician. I mean, after all, hasn't he won the third term or something? I mean, that's that's quite an achievement. And you don't you don't win three straight terms by uh, uh, carrying out your campaign promises to the to the electorate. You do it by playing ball with the right people. One of Prime Minister Hawke's first actions was to agree secretly to test an American first strike missile in Australian waters. A move apparently so rash that it was turned down by his own cabinet. In the pursuit. Today the American bases are no longer in jeopardy and nuclear ships can enter Australian ports again. Australian politicians have learned their lessons and once again are all the way with the USA. But many Australians have not forgotten the vision of the Evert and Whitlam years, which no amount of false pragmatism will extinguish. Small nations have the right to a future not determined by nuclear giants. New Zealand has shown the way by banning nuclear weapons from its waters. And if there is ever to be a genuine nuclear-free South Pacific, it will be due to the courage of New Zealand. And Australia should be at her side. Only then would both superpowers be obliged to listen to voices of sanity in this highly contested region. And only then would Australia break free from its imperial past and present. And breaking free is surely the only future. Now when I was a young man, I carried me pack. And I lived a free life on the rover From the Murray's Green Basin to the dusty outback Well, I waltzed my Matilda all over Then in 1915, my country said, son It's time you stop rambling there's work to be done So they gave me a tin hat And they gave me a gun And they marched me away to the war And the band played waltzing Matilda As the ship pulled away from the quay Midst all the cheers, the flag waving and the tears, we sailed off for Gallagher. Missing from this film is one epic war Australians have fought and died in. There's no reference to it at this memorial. Indeed, in a country littered with war memorials and cenotaphs, not one stands for those who fought and fell in defence of their own country on their own soil, the Aboriginal people, the true Australians. Untold numbers died fighting that war, and regardless of all the Australian blood spilt in foreign fields, the truth is that our own country is still only half won. And that won't change until we right the wrongs of the bloody past and offer the first Australians genuine rights to their land. In other words, until we give back their nationhood, we can never claim our own. But the band plays waltzing Matilda And the old men still answer the call But as year follows year More old men disappear Someday no one who march there at all Waltzing Matilda Waltzing Matilda Who'll come a waltzing Matilda with me And their ghosts may be heard As they march by that billboard 
Oh, come a waltzing Matilda 